Behold the normal distribution, this very beautiful and symmetric bell-shaped curve. It is, you know, a symmetric curve. Uh, here, just to make the point, here is a non-symmetric curve. And it's a very famous symmetric curve. Uh, uh, we call it the normal distribution, but in fact, uh, it's doing it an injustice because it's the most unusual distribution. We'd be better off calling it the Gaussian distribution in favor of Carl Friedrich Gauss. He's the gentleman who, in 1796, provided many of the mathematical arguments which give rise to the importance of this probability density function, the normal distribution. Now, you remember it's a density function, and to explain what we mean by that, I want you to imagine lots and lots of observations y being spawned by this particular normal distribution. And I want you to order them from smallest to largest. And then think of how frequently you'll run into very small ones as opposed to very large ones. And you'll notice as you come across the curve here, the very smallest of the observations don't happen very frequently at all. And then as the observations get larger and larger, you begin to run into them with more and more frequency. Now, the density of these observations begins to build up. And as you go towards the center of the curve, it's very dense indeed and happen very often indeed. And then as you get off here to the upper tail of the curve, why the very larger values occur with less and less frequency. And after a while, that curve asymptotes out and goes to zero. This is a probability density function. It shows how the density of the observations change as their magnitudes change. Well, it behooves us to um, think in terms of a normal distribution function with a few numbers locked into it. So let's go over here and look at another normal density function. Here we see one on the board. Here's the f of y, the frequency or the density function, and along this horizontal axis, the y's are plotted. And you'll notice here at 50, this is where the ordinate of the curve is greatest, and so that would be called the mode of the distribution. And at 50, we also notice that's the position that divides the area under the curve into two equal portions. And that, of course, would be called the median of the distribution. But more important than either one of these characteristics is the first moment of the distribution, the point of balance of this distribution. That's called the mean of the distribution, sometimes referred to as the location parameter. And so we'll see in this instance that the mean of the distribution, eta, that's a symbol we're reserving for the mean, you'll recall, eta is equal to 50. And now that I've told you about the mean of the distribution, let's talk about the variance of the distribution. I'll just tell you what the variance in this case. The variance sigma squared is equal to 64. Now, there's a very unusual thing about the uh, normal distribution. If you take the square root of the variance, you get something called the standard deviation, sometimes referred to as the scale parameter of the normal distribution. And the standard deviation of this distribution, sigma, is equal to 8. And what does it mean geometrically? Watch this. The distance from the mean out to the point of inflection on the curve is eight units. Happens to be the standard deviation. That's true for all normal distributions. You'll all remember what the point of inflection is. It's the point where this, this curve you see here gets most steep before it's getting more shallow. And the distance from the mean out to the point of inflection on the curve is the standard deviation. Of course, you can always define the standard deviation for any distribution, but for the normal distribution, it has this important and interesting definition. Okay, now let's take a look at the mathematical uh, function uh, which relates to the normal distribution. And we have there that f of y, that's our frequency function, f of y is equal to... Now this looks pretty complicated, but it isn't all that bad. Equals 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma. This is the constant, incidentally, which makes the area under that curve equal to 1. e to the minus y minus eta, quantity squared, divided down by 2 sigma squared. Pi is our old friend 3.14159. e is the base of the natural logarithms. Those are just mathematical constants. And this distribution function has two parameters. One is the mean, eta, and the other is the variance, sigma squared. And if you tell me eta and sigma squared, you completely characterize the distribution. You need not tell me anything at all, at all except mean and the variance. There are thousands and thousands of normal distributions. There's a normal distribution for every value of eta and every value of sigma squared. Well, let's see what our normal function looks like in our particular case. You'll recall that the mean of that distribution was 50. And similarly, that the variance was equal to 64. And finally, substituting in there for the standard deviation, this positive square root of the variance, there we have it, equal to 8. So if you wanted to know what the exact mathematical equation was for that particular normal curve we looked at previously, there it is. 1 over the square root of 2 pi 8 times 8, e to the minus y minus 50, quantity squared, divided down by 128. That's the equation of that normal curve we previously saw. 
Okay, suppose someone comes to me and says, Stu, what's the probability that uh, I'll get, uh, randomly uh, get, an observation y greater than or equal to 62? Let's see what sort of a problem uh, that leads us to. Now, the event that we're talking about in this particular instance is 62. That's the thing that's happened to us. Y is equal to 62. And the question which is being raised in this case is, what's the probability of this event, which leads me to worry about this event and something more extraordinary? And so we find ourselves in a situation of determining the area under this curve from 62 all the way out to plus infinity. In other words, I'm required to get the shaded area under the curve as illustrated here. Now, I promise you, this is a rugged mathematical problem. And just to show you what we're up against, we're going to have to take the normal probability density function for this particular curve, uh, which we saw previously, and we're going to have to integrate that expression from 62 all the way out to plus infinity. And there you see the integration being formed. We're going to have to integrate the expression from 62 all the way out to plus infinity, and we have to do that particular operation. We'll have to evaluate uh, that definite integral. Golly, Pete, that's a hard job. And someone might say, well, why in the devil don't you tabulate that so that we don't have all the work of evaluating that definite integral each time? And the answer is that would also be a terrible job because there's a different normal distribution for every selection of the mean and the variance. And that would make a tremendous number of tables to determine uh, the areas associated with these questions like events such as 62 and greater. And so what we've done is we've made the problem easy. We're all interested in tricks which will make such mathematical expressions easier to handle. And so that leads us to a discussion of a very important item called the normal deviate. And so let's talk about uh, the normal deviate. And we're going to reserve a symbol for the normal deviate. We're always going to use the letter, lowercase letter Z. Now, I put that little horizontal line through the Z because we're afraid sometimes Zs will end up looking like twos, and that would be unfortunate. So that's a lowercase Z. And what is Z equal to? What's the normal deviate equal to? Well, here's the trick. You take all the observations that were in the normal distribution, all those Ys, and from each one of them, you subtract data. And that will give you another set of quantities. And they'll still have standard deviation sigma, whatever sigma happens to be, but they'll have a mean, these new quantities, equal to zero. Now suppose I take all these quantities and divide them by their standard deviation. Now I'll get a host of quantities that have a mean zero, and the distance out the point of inflection on the curve will be equal to one. That's a very happy thing to have, and so if we evaluate the normal deviate, z equals y minus zeta, take the observations y, subtract out the mean, and divide through by the standard deviation, we'll construct things called the normal deviates. And here's a picture of the distribution of the normal deviates. Uh, you'll notice it's also a normal distribution, except this normal distribution has a mean of zero, and it has a variance equal to one. And thus, of course, its standard deviation would be equal to one. And we've tried to arrange things here so that the distance out to the point of inflection on the curve is indeed equal to one. Now, that normal curve is the standardized normal distribution, and it's that normal distribution that is tabulated in all our tables. We can determine the areas under this curve very easily by reference to tables. And so let's do our problem. The original problem is the mean is 50, the variance is 64, and the event is y equals 62, and the question raises, what's the probability of that event or something more extraordinary? Okay, let's just plow ahead here. Y, well, Y was equal to 62. The event was 62. And the mean was equal to 50, you'll recall. And the square root of the variance, the variance was 64, so the square root's 8. Right. 62 minus 50 is 12 divided by 8. And if my arithmetic is still OK, that ought to come out equal to 1 and a half. So we have now observed a normal deviate equal to 1 and a half. And so now the trick is, what's the probability we'll observe a normal deviate equal to a half, one and a half, or something greater? And you see we're once again trying to discover the area in the tail of the curve. Now fortunately for all of us, that's something that's tabulated. And I have up here, happily, a table of the areas under the normal curve associated with different values of sigma and different values of, uh, different values of z, I beg your pardon. And running down here, let's see, z equal one and a half, that leaves 0 0.067 in the tail of the curve. Now, in other words, the area in the tail of the curve is 0 0.067, or more formally, 
the probability that we'll observe a value of z greater than 1.5 is equal to 0 0.067. Well, that's the same as the previous problem we had over there, where we asked what was the probability of getting y greater than or equal to 62. The answer to that particular problem is identical. The probability we'll observe an observation y greater than or equal to 62 Given that the mean is 50, and given that the variance is 64, that probability is also 0 0.067. So, that's a very important trick, isn't it? And we could work other kinds of probability problems when you think about it. Suppose someone had come to you and say, well, what's the probability that you can find an observation y between the numbers 51 and 58, say? How would you proceed to uh, solve that problem? Well, that's really not too difficult. What we will do in that case is let's get the area from 51, right, all the way out to plus infinity. And then let's find out what the area is from 58, all the way out to plus infinity. And let's subtract those two areas. And when we do, we'll get the shaded area under the curve. And that indeed would be the probability that we would find an observation between y equals 51 and 58. <clears throat> If someone wanted to change the problem and say, what's the probability of getting an observation y between 51 and 53, say? It's just variations on a theme. We'd get the area from 51 to plus infinity, the area from 53 to plus infinity, and subtract them, and by gum, that would be the area in the shaded portion. That indeed would be the probability. Now watch something very interesting. What's the probability that y would be exactly equal to 53? Now, I know you can see a line there, but that line is supposed to be over the point 53, and it should be infinitesimally thin. And so there is no area over 53, exactly 53, and hence the probability that you will get exactly 53 is zero. This is a phenomenon that happens when you have a continuous probability density function. Y, remember, is measured on a continuous uh, scale here, and hence the probability of exact getting exactly any value of Y is zero, whether it be 52 or 17 or minus 412. Of course, for a discrete distribution where the observed values of Y can only take integer values, one, two, three, nothing in between, then you can have the probability of y equaling a specific value. But for a continuous distribution, the probability that y takes any specific value is equal to zero.